Here we are in Luke chapter 10. So if you'll turn now in your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. From Luke chapter 10 through the end of the book of Luke, much of what is written is unique to the gospel of Luke. Luke gives us insight about things related to the life and ministry of Jesus that the other gospels do not, which is the beauty of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because what one may not say, another will say, and then where there's overlap, we get kind of a concentrated look at different things related to the life and ministry of Jesus. But there are, there's much here in, in the last uh, several chapters of Luke that are, that, is, uh, that are unique to his gospel, and one of them is the story we're about to read. It's the last few verses of chapter 10. It's starting in verse 38 down through verse 42. It's the way that chapter 10 ends. So Luke 10, verse 38, it says, Now it happened as they went that he, that is Jesus, entered a certain village. And a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. Nothing like ordering Jesus around, right? <laughs> Feisty lady here she is. All right. Well, verse 41, and Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha. You know, you know anytime Jesus mentions your name twice, you're in trouble, right? <laughs> Martha, Martha. You are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. I've entitled today's teaching, An Enemy Named Busy. An Enemy Named Busy named busy. Yeah. In the first service, I got the same reaction, like, ooh, yeah. Why? Because we're busy. So this might step on some toes. It stepped on mine as I prepared it. So now I'm happy to step on yours too. <laughs> Let's pray first. Lord, thanks for this time in your word. And thank you, Lord, for the challenge that I pray that we would each receive today from this story to help us. We know, Lord, that you don't challenge us for no reason. You challenge us because you want to help us and stretch us and to make us more like you, Lord. So that's our prayer. And it's uncomfortable sometimes, but thank you that you use your word to teach us, Lord, and to instruct us. And so we pray you would do that by your Holy Spirit today. We love you and we thank you together in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. So I looked back on my teaching notes over the last 30 years that I've been pastoring here at Cornerstone, and I was pretty amazed to see that I had never taught on this story on a Sunday morning. Now, when we go uh, through the Bible on Wednesday nights, I go verse by verse. So I have hit this story a couple times uh, in the course of going through the Gospel of Luke on Wednesday nights. And I've referenced this story on many occasions, but I've never devoted a Sunday morning teaching to this story. It is probably somewhat familiar to many of you if you have been around the church long enough or if you know your, your Bibles uh, well enough, and it's familiar uh, to most of us. And it's a story about two sisters. They're named here, Mary and Martha. Now, this is not the only time that we are introduced to these sisters. They appear at other times in the gospel. Uh, for example, they have a brother, and their brother's name is Lazarus, that Lazarus whom Jesus raised from the dead. So they appear with that story in John chapter 11, and uh, in that story in John chapter 11, both Mary and Martha chide Jesus for being late to Lazarus' funeral. Each of them say to him, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. It's an interesting little dialogue that they have there in John chapter 11. So we see them there also. We see them in John chapter 12 as well. When after Lazarus is raised from the dead, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus invite Jesus to dinner at their home. And in John 12, Mary breaks open a very expensive uh, jar of um, precious oil and anoints the feet of Jesus and dries his feet with her hair. So this story here in, in Luke 10 is not the only time we read about Mary and, and Martha and, and their brother Lazarus. Uh, but, but here in this story, in Luke 10, we get to see the different sides of their personalities. Uh, and perhaps you identified with one of them or the other as we read through this story. You have Martha here who's very high strung. She's worried about things. She's flitting around, you know, perfectionist, wanting everything to be in order. That's, that's Martha. And Mary in this story is pretty chill. 
She's just kind of hanging out there with Jesus, listening to him, not saying or doing any, anything. In fact, uh, there's no dialogue that we see here in this story from Mary. She, she doesn't say anything. At least it's not recorded here. And, and because Mary is so chill, this ticks off Martha. You know people like this? If you're really chill and someone else is high stress type A, they think you're lazy and they get upset with you. And if you're really chill and you look at that high stress type A, you're just like, relax, like take a chill pill, like calm down. And so there's that dynamic in friendships and relationships and families. And here's this dynamic. Well, Mary is so chill, it ticks off Martha. And she's all bothered because Martha's going around the house, you know, she's vacuuming, cleaning toilets and cleaning the stove. They didn't really have that first century, but go with me. And she's doing all this stuff, cleaning, doing something. I don't know what she's actually doing in a house in the first century, but she's busy getting it all together. And Mary's sitting there listening to Jesus, sitting at his feet. And so Martha goes to Jesus in verse 40 and she says, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. Tell her to help me, she says. Now, don't think that Mary is just being lazy. Mary's not being lazy. And, and Martha is not the model Christian with a servant's heart. Don't think that about either one of them. Mary's not lazy. And Martha's not this model Christian. You, you know, I'm serving, I'm serving the Lord. I have a servant's heart. Okay, thanks, Martha. But the fact is, the Bible here describes her in verse 40 as distracted. She's distracted and Jesus calls her out in verse 41 and he says that she's being worried and troubled. He says, you're, you're, you're worried and you're troubled about many things. Some translations use the word anxious and upset. I, I think it's the Message Bible that might say, you be tripping. So, uh, <laughs> not really, but I don't really like the Message Bible, so I make fun of it. Um, <laughs> And, and, but, but you get the picture here. So Martha's not this model Christian with a servant's heart. She's a model Christian of most of us with a busy life, with a busy life. And the thing is, she brought it all on herself. Who invited, when you look at this story, perhaps you picked up on it when I read through it, who invited Jesus to the house? Who invited Jesus to the house? Look at your Bibles. Verse 38, who invited Jesus to the house? Martha. Martha. Martha invited Jesus, not Mary, Martha did. And who's scurrying around trying to make everything just perfect? Martha. Martha invited him, and Martha's scurrying around here. In fact, it wouldn't surprise me if the reason that Martha appealed to Jesus, you know, Jesus, help, help get my sister off her tuchus and, and help me with all this going on. It wouldn't surprise me if the reason she appealed to Jesus is because she had first tried herself to get Mary motivated and it failed. Well, there's no dialogue about that part of the conversation, but I can just imagine Martha going to Mary and whispering to her like, psst, psst, it's not every day that we have the Son of God in our house. Would you please get, get off of Pinterest and start helping me? What's the matter with you? And it wouldn't have surprised me if Mary said, you're the one that invited him, you do the work. <laughs> All right? If you, if, if, if you're old enough, you remember the Waltons. I kind of picture the Baldwin sisters right here. A younger version of the Baldwin. Anyway, I just lost half the crowd. But, <laughs> but, but here they are, maybe having this dialogue. And so I'm wondering if it didn't go well when, she, when Martha's trying to motivate Mary herself. So after Mary may have said, like, well, you invited her. You do then that's when Martha went, Jesus, would you please tell her? Because she appeals to Jesus. Did she go to him first, or did she go after him secondly? I, I wonder here. Now, in fairness to Martha, I get it. It's not every day that God comes to your house for coffee. But in essence, when you look at how driven Martha was, there's three things that stand out to me about her. And here they are. She's distracted about what had to be done. She's worried about what hadn't been done, and she complains about who's not helping her to get it done. That's Martha. And by the way, that's you and me. Welcome to Loudoun County. <laughs> Welcome to, you know, Main Street, USA. This is how most people in America are living. 
We're, we're distracted about what had to be done. Everything's got to be done. Stuff's got to be done. Got to be done. Got to be done. Then we get worried about what we haven't done. And then we get upset because people aren't helping us to get it done. What she is here is a picture of every single one of us today. And what I find challenging about this story is that in most English translations of verse 40, it uses the word distracted almost every time. Martha was distracted. This is not, she's not doing something here that is this model Christian servant. She is, she's, she's out of control, high strung, um, distracted, and busy. And I thought to myself, by what? I mean, try to imagine a first century life and a first century home. Um, how distracted could she get with stuff? Because they didn't have the kind of things that we have. Think about it. There was no television. There were no movies. There was no internet. There's no social media like Instacrap and Facebook. Uh, there's just, you know, none of that. They'll probably cancel me for saying that. But um, no cell phones, no schools, no corporations, no retail stores, no sporting events, no emails, no lawns to mow, no cars to service, no planes to catch. I mean, what was so distracting in her life? So when you think about what a distracted life looked like in the first century, and here she is, all busy, I think to myself, if she was busy and anxious and worried about things in her day and distracted by all that had to get done, how much more so are we? How much more so are we distracted and anxious and worried and busy? Our lives are filled with things to do. There is no shortage of stuff to keep us busy. There are regular demands on our time that can sometimes make life crushing, and consequently, a lot of things suffer in our lives because we are so busy. Marriages suffer. Your health can suffer. Relationships with children can suffer. Relationships with friends. And most importantly, your relationship with Christ. Because when we're too busy, that all those things get squeezed out to whatever leftover time we have, which isn't much, then we find how many of those things end up suffering in our lives, which is why I entitled this teaching An Enemy Named Busy. Someone once said this, if Satan can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. When we think about how Jesus said that the enemy came to steal, kill, and destroy, you might wonder, Kill in what way? Destroy in what way? Steal in what way? One of the ways he'll work on you is to steal your time, to cause you to become so busy that you lose sight of the more important things. He loves to get us off track. He loves to cause things to suffer in our lives simply because we're not disciplined with our time. David said this in Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. New Living Translation said it this way, the Lord directs the steps of the godly. The Lord directs the steps of the godly. Here's my simple prayer, okay? Lord, direct my steps. We need God's help and wisdom to navigate all the busyness of our lives. And so when we look at this story, I'm going to share five quick things with you. The first is seen right here in this story and the other four, I'm using this story kind of as a launch pad to four other practical things. This, this is not going to be a deeply theological teaching today. This is going to be primarily a very practical thing because, you know, I believe the gospel is real for every aspect of our lives and we need, we need to understand this area of busyness and how often sometimes it, it can cause us great harm and we suffer in many ways because we're not good stewards of the time that God has given us in our day. The first thing that we see in this story is the importance in, in managing our time well, prioritize Jesus. That's gotta be number one. Prioritize Jesus. Now we see in this story here in verse 39 that Mary sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. It's a beautiful picture there of someone who's just unhurried and sitting at Jesus' feet listening to him. You know, he is the Word. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He's the, he's the Bible incarnate. He's the Word of God in flesh. And there she is just drinking in the Word of God as he's sharing. 
as he's teaching? Wouldn't you love to have learned what he had to say in their home privately to them? So this is important for us to understand because as Mary is doing this, sitting there at his feet, just listening, it tells us in verse 30, uh, 42 that Jesus turned to Martha. When Martha wanted Mary to be corrected, Jesus said in verse 42, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. He's like, I'm not going to correct her, because what she's doing is needful. The NIV said it this way, only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. In other words, Jesus is saying that if the choice is between busy work that doesn't really have to get done at the moment and sitting at Jesus' feet to learn, sit at Jesus' feet and learn. That's what he's saying. If given that choice, sit at Jesus' feet and learn every time. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of a list person. I like a list because at least if I have a list, how many of you are like list people? Okay, so if you have a list, at least it gives you some sense of satisfaction when you start crossing off your list. But how many of you understand, as I've come to learn over the years, your list is endless. Your list is endless. There's always something on the list. And there are times I despise the list. I'm like, no more lists. And then I feel disorganized and chaotic, so then I go back to the list. And the list is okay if it keeps you on track. But it's not okay if it consumes you. Because a lot of times we can find that there's so much stuff to do, we end up just do, 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 and it's just a bunch of do-do. Do you know what I'm saying to you? <laughs> and we're not, we're not really living. We're not really being. We're not really walking in fellowship with the Lord because we're too busy with my list. Thank you, Lord. I, I know you're waiting to have quiet time with me because you're ready for me anytime with open arms. I'm a little too busy for you right now. I've got a list. Well, the list can be an enemy. It can cause us in, uh, to, to feel like we got to constantly be in motion, and it fuels this sense of busyness. So when Mary sits here at Jesus' feet and just listens to his word, this is a reminder to us about the importance of spending time in prayer and reading your Bibles, not just on Sundays and Wednesdays, but all through the week. Now, how does that look for you and me, like in practical ways? How does it, how does it look to sit at Jesus' feet, to, to, to drink in his word, spend time in prayer? Well, you know, I, I don't know how it works for you, but it has to be something that we're intentional about. Uh, for some, uh, maybe you're an early riser, get up early, take your Bible to a quiet place, and read and pray. Now, you know, look, I, I'm at an age now where my wife and I have three grown kids, they're married, and we have grandkids now. But I was in a position like many of you who are young parents with young kids, and you're thinking, my, my baby already gets up like a rooster, you know, announcing the morning. How, how much earlier do I need to get up? You know, and you're, and you're always exhausted because, you know, raising kids is tiring. And the question just becomes that I had to ask myself in that day too was, well, how, how good am I really going to be as a parent, as a husband, as anything else if I don't really spend time with the Lord? And so you have to get up even earlier. You have to get up even earlier. Now, don't be legalistic about it. You know, again, some of you might be better off ending your day when everything is quiet, the house is quiet, and you can have some quiet time with the Lord at the end of the day. Isaiah said in Isaiah 26, 9, with my soul I have desired you in the night. Yes, by my spirit within me I will seek you early. Isaiah there writes about how he needs the Lord both at night and early in the morning. So we need to have that time where we carve it out with the Lord to draw near to Him. Maybe for some of you, your quiet time might be because you have a long commute to work. And you can put the, the Bible on audio, and you can listen to Scripture, and you can be praying in, in, in your car, you know, whatever might work. i got to be honest with you, sometimes the best quality time I've had with Jesus is alone in the woods taking a hike, or somewhere on the side of a pond with a fishing pole. I'm serious. There have been times where that's when I can just have this sense of just calm and quiet and being alone with the Lord. But I will tell you this, the more time I spend with Him in prayer and Bible study, the better my day goes. And most of us can testify to the fact that if you don't order your day with, with seeking the Lord, your day ends up being much more chaotic, you're more frazzled at the end of the day, you got a headache, you're stressed, and all these things that you couldn't anticipate ended up happening. And I've just noticed over the years that the more I'm careful to start my day with prayer in the Bible, the better off my day goes. 
And I've personally noticed, and I share this with you if this helps you, but it's helped me over the years. I've noticed that Proverbs in the morning gives me wisdom for the day, and Psalms at night helps to put my mind at rest. But whatever works for you, the important thing is have time that you pray and have time that you're in the Word. I don't say this legalistically. This is for our benefit. Right? It's not like God's up in heaven going, wow, you know, I'm not really complete until I have time with you. No, he's fine regardless because he's complete in and of himself. We need it. We need to draw near to him, to spend time in fellowship with him. But again, don't be legalistic. If you're trying to work your way through the one-year Bible and it takes you five years to get through the one-year Bible, fine. Just be consistent. And spend that time with him. Prioritize your day. Number two, you've got to hustle through some of these things. Uh, number two, cherish family. When we talk about carving time and, and uh, ordering our steps, too many marriages and relationships with children have been sacrificed on the altar of busyness. And one of the biggest culprits is a career the drive for that career. Now, I, I, know, I know the vicious cycle. What happens is you, you want the career to help provide for the family, but then the career takes over your time and you're not there as much for your family. And then you start feeling this tension of like, and perhaps somebody in the family, you know, <laughs> kind of adds to that tension because they're reminding you, like, you're never here, you're never here. Yeah, well, the reason I'm never here is because I'm trying to work a job. Yeah, but you're, not, but you're not here, and so we need you here. Yeah, but if I don't have the job, you know, then I can't provide for you. And, it's, and here we go, off to the races, right? It's like this constant tension of trying to work and provide and trying to be there for your family. Um, and, I, and I know that Loudoun County is a particularly expensive place to live, as are many other places around the country. But if I could just say to you from a pastoral heart, if at all possible, if at all possible, and I know sometimes it, it just isn't, but if at all possible, tighten your belts and live off of tuna fish and ramen noodles and one income so that at least one parent can be home with kids when you're raising kids. It's important. When Terry and I first got married, she was a school teacher in Loudoun County Public Schools. My, how times have changed. <laughs> and when she got pregnant with our first child, with Tyler, it was her heart and my heart, and I'm glad my wife had this heart, that she just, she wanted to come home. Now, I'm, I'm having a baby, I wanna raise kids. And so we had to learn, and I was a youth pastor, she was a school teacher, I was a youth pastor. We had to learn to live off of one income and a youth pastor's income at that, okay? I remember the, at the church where I served, the lady who wrote my checks would come to me periodically and be like, are you okay? I'd be like, why? She goes, she goes, because I write your checks. I know what you make and I don't know how you're doing it. Raising, raising uh, Tyler and your wife doesn't work and I don't know how you do it. I said, well, it's a God story. But here's the thing, we all make choices. And if you want to do something bad enough, you work at it hard enough. And we decided that we were going to tighten our belts and we were going to make it work on my income. And, and that meant certain sacrifices, but that's what you do when something's important enough. So for example, here's just one tiny example of what we did. I remember we couldn't afford, on the budget that we had going, we couldn't afford disposable diapers for Tyler. So we went with cloth diapers, cloth diapers. I had to ask in the first service if they still even make cloth diapers, they do. So we had cloth diapers for Tyler. Tyler's sitting over here, he might be a little scarred uh, from it all. <laughs> Yeah, there he is. Um, but, but Terry and I use cloth diapers. I didn't see you here, honey, on the, on, uh, in this service. So my dear wife, wanting to, you know, put her kids and her family first rather than I, I want a career. And God bless you, honey, for doing that, raising our kids. But I, I can remember that diaper pail. That was not pretty, let me tell you what. <laughs> I can still smell the mixture of bleach. Bleach, have you gone with me now already with this? Bleach and, and baby poop, you know, in that diaper pail and then and doing laundry. And I can remember too, how many times did I stick myself changing diapers with those safety pins when you're pushing them through? Oh, I got closer to Jesus in those moments, let me tell you what. 
But I'm just saying those are the sacrifices that, that people make when you're like, okay, this is important enough. So for us as a family, this is what we're going to decide and we're going to cut this out and cut that out to make this work. That's what you do. And listen, I know that there might be some extenuating circumstances where dads are the stay at home parent, but otherwise... When I look at Genesis chapter 3, after the fall, God puts the burden on men working to provide for their families and the dignity that that is for men to work hard and in Genesis 3 for women to nurture children. And I just want to say this, as I mentioned a moment ago to honor my own wife, if you are a stay-at-home mom, don't you ever let progressive feminists shame you for not being a career woman. Don't you dare let them do that. Because no one can love and raise your children better than you. And I'll add this too. I think one of the most valuable things that you can do is to get a babysitter once in a while and go out as a couple to stay close as husbands and wives and to stay close to your children by being there for their concerts, recitals, and ball games. But all this takes time takes time. And don't say, well, I may not give, you know, quantity of time, but at least I give quality of time. That's a cop-out. Kids and spouses need quantity of time. So we have to make certain sacrifices. There is an epidemic of absent fathers in America. An epidemic of absent fathers in America, particularly in the black community. And I remember when Barack Obama was challenging the black community about absent fathers, and he quoted some statistics, and I'll quote them for you. Children who grow up without a father are five times more likely to live in poverty and commit crime, nine times more likely to drop out of schools, and 20 times more likely to end up in prison. White, black, brown, whatever, there needs to be dads who take responsibility to be loving leaders in their homes. And it's going to take for moms and dads to be good husbands and wives and to be good moms and dads to be disciplined with our time. You know, one of the saddest songs to ever illustrate this is the song Cats in the Cradle. How many of you remember that song, Cats in the Cradle? I'm going to, for those of you who are too young to know this song, it was 1974 by Harry Chapin. And, I'm, and it's a little bit long and, and I'm stepping over my time, but this is, this is a song that'll stick with you. Listen to the, to the words. My child arrived just the other day. He came to the world in the usual way, but there were planes to catch and bills to pay. He learned to walk while I was away. And he was talking before I knew it. And as he grew, he'd say, I'm going to be like you, dad. You know, I'm going to be like you. And the cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon, little boy blue and the man on the moon. When you coming home, dad, I don't know when, but we'll get together then. You know we'll have a good time then. My son turned 10 just the other day. He said, thanks for the ball, dad. Come on, let's play. Can you teach me to throw? I said, not today. I got a lot to do. He said, that's okay. And he walked away, but his smile never dimmed and said, I'm going to be like him. Yeah, you know I'm going to be like him. I'll skip the chorus. Next verse. Well, he came from college just the other day. So much like a man, I just had to say, son, I'm proud of you. Can you sit for a while? He shook his head and said with a smile, what I'd really like, dad, is to borrow the car keys. See you later. Can I have them, please? I've long since retired. My son's moved away. I called him up just the other day. I said, I'd like to see you if you don't mind. He said, I'd love to, Dad, if I can find the time. You see, my new job's a hassle and the kids have the flu, but it's sure nice talking to you, Dad. It's been sure nice talking to you. And as I hung up the phone, it occurred to me, he'd grown up just like me. My boy was just like me. It's important. Time is a gift that God has given us. We must manage it carefully. Number three, schedule pauses. Just like a musical chart, there are pauses or rests in order to catch your breath or to keep the song at a certain tempo. And so we must intentionally put pauses or rests into our schedule. And I'm not talking about vacations, although that's vital too. 
I'm talking about not cramming so much into your day or into your week, but actually scheduling a pause on your calendar like it's an important appointment, because it is. Just the other day, Terry and I were, we got out our calendar, it hangs on our refrigerator, and we were looking at the different events we had going on at church and different places we had to be and different things happening. And there was one event after another, one thing through September and October. And so there, there's an event that we're going to out of town and we could have left the next day after another event. And I said, no, we're gonna put, we're gonna put this one day here as a pause day to let us catch our breath between all the things that we're doing. Because if you, if you don't schedule the pauses, you'll fill it with something. And then you'll end up suffering for it in some way. So you have to schedule the pauses. And I, looked, I learned years ago from somebody who was helping me manage my own time and schedule. You write in certain blocks on your calendar to pace yourself better and that is just as vital an appointment as if you had a doctor's appointment. Like that, that is something that's gonna be sacred time. Now, when, when that time comes and you've blocked it off, you get to decide how you might want to use it. And if you're married, you know, you get to decide together how you might want to use it. But at least it's not going to get crowded out by other things. So that when you've actually put in there this appointment like, you know, rest, right, in this particular evening or this day or whatever, then when somebody asks you, do this, can you do this or do that, you have the freedom to say yes or no. And if you say no because you, you know it's not a good use of your time, you can just with a straight face say, I have another appointment. Because you've already put it on your calendar, I have another appointment. Now they don't need to know, who's your appointment with? Well, there's somebody I'm going to meet with called I'm arresting. <laughs> who's I'm a? Well, you don't, you don't know the person, but, uh, but I got an appointment with I'm arresting. And, uh, and you write it in that way so you can safeguard it. It's important that we, that we put pauses into our lives. This will help to pace ourselves. You know, you can either make your own pace or you can get a pacemaker. Do you know what I'm saying to you? Because that's what's going to happen. You don't pace yourself, you're going to end up getting the pacemaker. All right, number four, incorporate friendships. This is also an important part of our, of our time. Because if you don't have time to just have fun with friends once in a while, then you're too busy. Well, I got to be responsible. Yeah, I get that. We want responsible people. But it can't just be a life of constant responsibility. You have to have some fun sometimes, too. We need friends. God designed us to be in fellowship and friendship. The Bible says in Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. And in Proverbs 27, 17, it says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. And it's just universal. I mean, you know, a woman can sharpen another woman, iron sharpens iron. We need each other is, is the idea in Proverbs. Now, listen, a wife or a husband can be obviously your best friend, but even then, I know that Terry needs female friends to meet needs in her as a woman that I can't, and vice versa. She knows sometimes I need some guy time because there are things that, that guys do in meeting needs as guys that she can't. So it's important to still have time to have some friendship, but don't go overboard. It shouldn't be to the extreme. You know, like I heard the story one time, sometimes, you know, how men can like golf and neglect their families and just be out golfing like it's an idol, which I've never really, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I've never got into golfing because I, I, don't, I don't play a sport where I don't sweat. But anyway, uh, <laughs> so I heard the story about this guy who was out golfing all the time, golf, 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 golf. One day about the eighth hole, there's this funeral procession that drove by the golf course. And he put down his club and he just kind of stood there very solemnly, put his hand over his heart and just kind of bowed his head and got a little weepy. And his buddies are like, dude, what's, what's going on? And he's looking at this funeral procession. And the guy said, well, after 40 years of marriage, that's the least I could do. Isn't that terrible? <laughs> that's the way guys are with golfing. Anyway, all right. I've got one last, did somebody just say preach it? All right, I've got one last. <laughs> One last point. Here we go. Here we go. Last one. Say no. Now look, this is not just a motto for drugs, friends. <laughs> Some of you are just overcommitted because you don't know how to say no. And that's the reason why you're so busy. You're just overcommitted. You don't know how to say no. You want to please everybody and you think people will be upset if you don't say yes. 
Learn to say no. But don't say, I don't have time, because you do. Every single one of us has been given the same 24-hour time period every single day by God. The question is, how are you going to use those 24 hours that God has given you? So don't say, I don't have time, because you do. The real answer should be something like, I don't believe that that's a good use of my time. Or if that sounds too harsh, say something like, I can't do that with the time that I have. But don't say, I don't have time. The deal is, we need to be asking God what He wants us to do with the time He has given us. Think of time like every precious thing God has given you, because it is. It's a gift. The time that we have is a gift from God, and we don't know how much time that we have. He does. And so we need to be good stewards or managers of the time that God has entrusted to us. And so maybe it needs to start with us learning how to say no to some demands of our time. And I would submit to you, and I say this to myself also, when you look at this list of five, if you fail at any one of these, you're probably too busy. Because God designed you to prioritize Him, to be there for your spouse and kids if you have them, to have intentional rests, to enjoy friendships, and to say no to things that God doesn't want you to do. So when you hear Jesus in this story saying, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, ask yourself, would he, be, would he have said my name in that challenge? Can you hear Jesus saying your name instead of Martha's name? You are worried and troubled about many things. Because if so, back to what I quoted earlier from Psalm 37, 23, then let our prayer simply be, Lord, order my steps. Order my steps. Let's pray that. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word and for this story that reminds us it's easy to be busy, to be distracted, to be worried about many things. And if it was a problem in the first century, how much more of a potential problem is it for us today when there are so many things that are competing for our time and attention? God, forgive us when we've been so busy that we have not been good stewards or managers of the time that you've given us. We haven't prioritized you. We've neglected our family. We don't have friends. We're, we're just uh, running around. Uh, we haven't uh, put intentional pauses in, in, into our schedules. Lord, you, you told us that man was not made for the Sabbath, Sabbath for the man. You know how much we need to rest. And Lord, help us to say no to things that you don't want us to do. There's only so much time that you've given us in a day. And may we manage it well for your glory. Lord, order our steps. Help us to restructure our lives so that it might be in better order with the time that you've given us. And I pray right now for those who are doing a serious inventory of their lives, Lord, where they need to make adjustments, help them. Some of them are suffering in their marriages or with their kids or maybe their health. And Lord, you're, you're the God who gives wisdom from above. So give them wisdom how to make changes that would glorify you, that would prioritize you. But we need your help, Lord. This world is busy and chaotic, so help us that we might live a life that glorifies you, even, yes, with the gift of time. We praise you together in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen and amen. God bless you all.